All right, hello again, everybody. We are back out here in the minivan for today's lecture. It is a cold and gray, kind of snowy Saturday afternoon here in Calgary, Alberta. We finally have some wintertime weather, but that only stands to reason because it's December 4th. Christmas is only three weeks away, uh, and we're almost at the tail end of the fall semester. But before we get there, we're going to learn, learn a little bit about multiple regressions and model building. And actually, um, my original title for this uh, lecture was multiple regression, but I've kind of modified it a bit um, to have less math in it that we don't really need and more discussion of uh, what I'm calling model building here. So uh, with that in mind, let's get into it. Um, mostly what we want to do um, for the rest of the lectures in the semester is kind of build on the skills we have to give us more capability in terms of like uh, the kinds of tests we can run and what kind of data we can deal with uh, when we're doing statistical analysis of language data. So uh, this is just a review. Uh, and again, normally I, ask this, I, will, I will ask this question in class um, so that people can just remind themselves of what sort of tests we have available to us. But uh, when we have an independent uh, data set that is categorical in nature, it has two different groups. Um, and then the dependent measure is gradient, say like VOT or F0 or something, we can use a t-test to analyze that sort of data set. Uh, if we have mo more than two groups, or at the same time just two groups as well, uh, in our independent uh, variable, or even more than one independent variable on top of that, then we can use an ANOVA if we have a categorical to gradient relationship. Um, we've also talked about linear regressions, which show us the connections between gradient variables and uh, gradient independent variables and gradient dependent variables. Uh, and most recently, we talked about this connection between uh, two different categorical data types. Um, if we have a categorical independent variable and a categorical dependent variable, we can use either chi-squared tests or proportion tests, both, both of which we talked about last time. It's getting warm in here. I think I'm going to take off the hat. We're going to get serious. So what we want to do is expand this table to include the following. Um, and this is what we're going to talk about today a little bit, which is multiple regression. Uh, so this is basically going to be the same kind of data setup that we have in linear regression, where we have a gradient independent and a gradient dependent variable. But for multiple regression, we can have more than two um, independent variables that are all gradient in nature, and we can look at how they um, correlate or um, predict the values of the dependent variable, which are also gradient in nature. Um, and the next time we'll talk about logistic regression, where uh, independent variables are going to be categorical, but we can have uh, two or more of those as well. Um, so that's mostly what we're going to expand to in what little time we have left together. Uh, and today we're just going to focus on multiple regression. So. Uh, buckle your seatbelts. We're going to take a little road trip here. So in order to understand how multiple regression works, uh, we'll first need to learn about a new statistical technique called maximum likelihood estimation. Now I know why it's so warm. Um, and anyways, uh, if we um, go over to the course website, I've posted a link for this in the readings. So this is the NJ Myung. Um, paper here from 2003. It's a tutorial on maximum likelihood estimation. And uh, this is a nice little read. Um, basically, uh, I would say all you need for this class are the first three to four pages here. Um, yeah, by the time he gets into page five here and this sort of thing, uh, that's more than you really need to know. But I'm going to try to walk us through um, up to the likelihood equation here, basically 3.1. Um, yeah, and as it says here, this is a um, principle, which is once again originally developed by R.A. Fisher, um, who you may recall from previous lectures. Uh, so we'll have to get that sort of into place to understand um, how our model building process works for multiple regression. Um, we will then tie that technique in next time with chi-squared analysis to produce logistic regressions. Uh, and then finally, in the last set of lectures, we're going to talk about these linear mixed effects models, which have become quite popular recently because um, they're quite adaptable, basically. Um, and that's, um, and also, there's another reason for that is that increased computing power has made this technique a lot more practical than it used to be uh, back when Ronald Fisher first developed it back in the 20s. So um, mixed effects models are revised analytical approach to the sorts of data scenarios where previously um, we would have used uh, analysis of variance, but since that um, can't handle the various types of data we normally get um, in the sort of categorical to gradient connection setup right here. 
Uh, we use mixed effects models because they're just more flexible uh, and don't require as many assumptions as um, an ANOVA does. So anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's begin with our analysis of multiple regression uh, and also model building in principle. So we're going to start adding independent factors to our regression analysis. And when we do that, as soon as we go beyond like two, um, we can, you know, there's the old joke about like counting systems. Uh, the most basic counting system is like one, two, many, right? So as soon as we get the three, four, five, six, so on and so forth, uh, there's no real limit to how many factors you can add. So it's an open question as to how many factors you might want to add, or like where might you actually want to stop with this. Um, so we could, in principle, add an explanatory factor for each data point we get and get perfect predictions every time. And I think I kind of mentioned this. Sorry, I'm just, it's cold out and I'm trying to modify the, <clears throat> modify the um, heater so that I both don't freeze to death and don't overheat at the same time. Um, I think uh, if we go back to our ANOVA example, I was walking you through kind of how we set up these models um, and Right, so maybe this is the one I want to pick here. So remember, we have like these different factors in the model, and then there's this residual variance, which I'm calling random error here, which is left over at the end. Um, and this is just for any particular data point, we have a certain amount of error that we can't predict from our general factors. But we could say, you know, there's this other factor, which is just unique to this particular data point, the e, the epsilon i sub j um, data point factor and we can predict that value perfectly uh, in that particular case and we just have to come up with enough of those like 15 different ones for this data set to get perfect prediction every time but the cost of doing that is that we have all these ad hoc factors that we're just coming up with on the fly for particular data points uh, which don't necessarily generalize to anything else out there in the world um, so the question is what good would it do us to do that um, and when we sorry <laughs> I'll get it right eventually. But uh, in doing this, we might want to keep in mind Occam's razor, um, which is that, and you normally I ask in class, what is Occam ra Occam's razor? And actually, it's a good question to ask because a lot of people, a lot of, you know, smart kids in linguistics will know what Occam's razor is, but everybody kind of expresses it in a different way. If you look it up on the internet, uh, it's officially supposed to be entities are not to be multiplied without necessity. Um, but a lot of people remember it as the simplest explanation is the best one. Uh, and this is a principle that often gets used either implicitly or explicitly in model building in linguistics, right? So uh, there's a desire to have parsimonious models or parsimonious explanations of whatever linguistic data that we're dealing with. Um, and not necessarily in sort of the quantitative model building sort of world, but simply like, you know, uh, should we have minimal like minimalism, right, in syntax, uh, or should we have sort of reduced the amount of um, redundancy there is in sort of phonological representations, that sort of thing. Usually throughout the history of linguistics, it's been a goal to get the simplest explanation possible that has the most coverage on the basis of a few like minor or a few set principles um, in our theory. So that's basically how Occam's razor gets implemented in reality. Um, I guess I'll mention, as long as we're here and I'm thinking about it, that uh, this is how I spell Occam. Uh, it turns out Occam was a uh, medieval monk um, from like the 1200s or something in England. Uh, and so you might often see it uh, spelled this way, uh, which is fine. Um, it's the Latin way of spelling the same name, um, but I spell it the English way because, well, Occam was English, but he was writing in Latin because in the Middle Ages, that's what everybody did if they were writing anything for publication. But um, that's where that comes from. And it's just kind of funny uh, for a moment to think that some of these like classical principles we have in um, sort of quantitative modeling theory, like Bayes', Bayes theory or Bayesian analysis or Occam's razor or whatever, uh, come from clerics back in the day uh, who, you know, <laughs> whatever they devoted their lives to at the time, they're remembered for this at the end of the day. Anyways, um, there is a danger in doing what I just showed you uh, for the ANOVA data set and coming up with like particular factors which exactly predict the value of whatever data you get. Uh, in your data set. Uh, 
it's called overfitting, and this is not just applicable only to an analyzing data that comes from an experiment or something like that, but it also is a principle in, say, like building um, computer programs or whatever ha you have that is trying to figure out sort of what underlying principles generate a set of data. Um, because you can come up with a lot of different parameters uh, or maybe even a few uh, and if they work really well for one sample, they may not work quite as well for a different sample from the same population. Um, so actually, I kind of jumbled what I wanted to say there. But when um, sometimes my students and I have worked on computational models of, say, speech perception phenomena. Uh, and, you know, one of the things you need to do for a model of speech perception is to train it up to kind of learn how to do the task that you want it to do. So often you'll take like a baby set of data and say, well, process this and do this task with it. And we'll kind of grade you on how accurate you are with the data set that we've given you. And also if you make mistakes, we'll tell you where those mistakes are so that you can improve upon them. Um, and this all sounds very humanistic, but it's basically how it works uh, even when you're working with a machine. The problem is you can like train a machine on this particular data set and it can get really good at that data set, maybe even 100%. But then what you have to do is to generalize it to some new data, right? It's not just, uh, that's not what humans do. Humans don't just sort of perceive one particular set of signals and it has to be exactly the same way all the time. Uh, they're more flexible than that. And when people speak in slightly different ways, they're able to sort of manage by adapting to those new signals and figuring out what they mean. Um, so humans, uh, well, I mean, there's a danger, I guess, sorry, I'm going to get a little philosophical here, uh, like a medieval monk, perhaps sitting in my car in the wintertime, but the, uh, there's a danger in overfitting, like almost everywhere you look. Uh, so, uh, in addition to explaining data or training a computer model, you can think of this again, like with COVID, right? So um, one of the interesting parts of that, insofar as you can just think of it as interesting and not sort of terrifying, but uh, older immune systems deal less well with the virus than younger immune systems do just in general. Um, and possibly what's going on there is that uh, older immune systems are kind of overfit to the dangers that they've gotten used to. Um, like my child is three years old and as my dad constantly reminds me and as I constantly observe with her like she picks up everything she gets sick on a regular basis and part of that I think this is a little hand wavy not scientific but part of what's going on there is simply her body is learning what sort of things out there will make her sick right our bodies have learned how to deal with those and maybe we don't get as sick as she does she has to go through that process when you're really old um, you've gone through that process quite a bit and your immune system knows kind of exactly what's out there and when something entirely new comes through it uh, like the new coronavirus then it has a big problem because it has to sort of um, adjust what it's been doing so far and adapt to this new enemy basically uh, we don't need to think necessarily in terms of disease or enemies when we're talking about creating a model and stats but it's like i said this sort of pattern is everywhere um, Parameters that work really well for one sample may not work quite as well for a different sample from the same population. And also, uh, we want to be able to explain data in terms that don't rely too heavily on the specific sample that we selected, right? So we don't have, want to have that sort of random choice we make uh, in terms of the data we feed to our computer model sort of entirely determine how the computer model works. There has to be something more general than that um, if, we need it, if we want it to be of value to anybody or anything else. So we thus have two potentially conflicting desiderata in building a model. On the one hand, we have explanatory simplicity. This is the Occam's razor part of it. Um, so just let's keep our model simple enough so that you know it's testable. And I think also another benefit of that is that it's easily understandable and other people can apply it as well. Uh, I think kind of the most influential scientific models are the ones that are simplest for better or for worse, just because they replicate better in you know other people's minds. Uh, really complicated models are cool to play around with and create, but you know if you give an hour-long talk on all sorts of fine-grained details that nobody understands, nobody's going to care at the end of the day, no matter how like accurate it might be at, at the end. But that's the counterbalance to the simplicity part of it, is that your model has to be accurate. It has to actually explain what's going on in the world. Otherwise, it doesn't have any real value in terms of you know being explanatory or a scientific theory of any sort. So um, a straightforward way to evaluate criterion number one 
is to simply count the number of parameters we include in the model. So the fewer the better. And this one's uh, kind of easy to do, uh, no matter what you're working with. Um, and there may be more sophisticated ways of evaluating this criterion as well, but that's the one we're going to use because it doesn't take a whole lot of thinking to say, well, the smaller number of rules we have, the easier it is um, to sort of pick up that theoretical baggage and make it work for you. Uh, so the other part of it, though, um, in order to evaluate criterion number two, we're going to apply this method that I mentioned a second ago called maximum likelihood estimation. Okay, so ultimately, this means that we want to be able to maximize our explanatory power while still maintaining a relatively parsimonious model in terms of the number of its parameters. So we're just trying to find that right balance between how many parameters we're going to use and like how much explanation do we get out of them. Um, and the way we're going to evaluate that overall is to use this um, quantity, which has this fun name. It's the Akaike, Akaike Information Criterion which, if you don't want to have to say all that, is abbreviated AIC. Um, and I didn't look it up, I apologize, but I assume there was some Japanese statistici statistician out there or mathematician out there who was named Akaike. Uh, yeah, four syllables, six phonemes, it's fun. Anyways, uh, I'm pretty sure Akaike came up with this idea, but there, it turns out there are other... Uh, information criteria out there. So you might see other variants on this, but this is the one, the kind of default one that we're going to use. The way it's defined, the AIC equals 2 times K minus 2 times the natural log of big L. Um, and K here just equals the number of parameters in the model. Uh, like I said, that one's pretty simple. Um, you know, just count 1, 2, 3, 4, so on and so forth. And then L gets um, quantified in a much more complex way, which we'll talk about. But L equals the likelihood of a parameter set given our observed values. Um, and at this point, this gets a little bit Bayesian, basically. So some of the math is going to be beyond us, what we need to know for this class. Uh, but it's kind of based on that um, sort of conditional probability idea, which I'm going to walk you through here in the next few slides. OK, so maximum likelihood estimation. Um, how does this work? Oh, I guess, first of all, didn't have room enough on this point, um, the previous slide for this point, but the AIC is defined so that more negative numbers represent better model fits. Um, so, right, uh, basically, you want to keep k small, and k is going to make this overall number po uh, bigger in a positive way. Um, and then L, you want to be big, so since you're subtracting L, the bigger L, the whole, the bigger L becomes the smaller AIC becomes, um, or the more negative AIC can become. So basically, more negative numbers means better overall. And I don't know why it was defined that way, but whatever. Um, I'm not the information criterion guy. I'm just here to let you know how it works. OK, ultimately, what the equation says is that we can only add a new parameter to the model if it improves the explanatory of the model over the simpler version of the model. So you know, we have like a model in place, and it explains things to this extent. Um, and then, you know, if we add a new parameter to it, uh, there's a penalty that comes from that. Uh, we're going to kind of knock the overall criterion level down just by adding a new parameter. But maybe it will explain things a little bit better and we'll come up to a higher level of explanatory power. Uh, and that will, like, overweigh or outweigh the um, uh, problematic nature of adding another parameter to it. Uh, so that's what the AIC does to us. It gives us just a number to sort of figure out. Um, how to weight that balance, basically. Uh, but again, Occam's razor still applies. We don't want to multiply explanatory entities needless needlessly. So anytime we add a parameter or an explanatory variable to the model, we get a penalty on the basis of that. And then we have to evaluate how much explanatory we get out of it. So that we will do with this maximum likelihood estimation. And like I said, there's a reading on this if you want to get somebody else's sort of view on this besides mine. Uh, but I'm just going to walk you through the first couple of pages of this in the next slides that follow. OK, so to understand this, uh, we have to make this subtle distinction between what's called likelihood, which is not probability. Um, so to do this, uh, in order to make likelihood estimations, we're going to have to turn probability on its head, basically, uh, which we were kind of already doing with um, the conditional probability lecture or the Bayesian analysis we kind of started um, a time or two ago. So I'll try to walk you through this the way the paper does, which is a nice kind of pretty simple example. What we're going to do is flip a coin 
10 times. And I don't have an actual coin. I don't have space to do it here in the minivan. Uh, we're going to do this digitally. But before we do that, um, let's say we're flipping a coin 10 times. How many heads do you think you're going to get when you do that? Uh, and if you say five, I will say that sounds like a reasonable guess. But will it always be five? Or will you wind up with like Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and get like 10 heads over and over again? Um, and here's how I'm going to try this. I'm going to use this. R command here. Um, hopefully you can see that. Maybe I'll move this up a bit. Uh, we're just going to sample from 0 to 1. We'll say 0 is tails and 1 is heads. We're going to do it 10 times. Uh, and then after each flip, we'll just do it again. So we get, oh, look at that. <laughs> the odds are with us. Uh, so we had 9 heads out of 10 flips. We almost got 10 in a row. Uh, so I guess Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are, are not dead. I don't know. Either way, they're not entirely here with us, but um, this could happen, right? You don't always get five heads out of 10 coin flips. Uh, and I'm sure you're watching this and say, oh, maybe you just program the computer to do that. Uh, okay, fine. So we'll do it again. Uh, you don't always get nine heads or five heads. In this case, you got three, so on and so forth. So there's a certain amount of randomness, right, in the output of this function, basically, the coin flipping function. So this is just to keep in mind, the number of heads that you get, or if you want to call them successes to make it more general, um, that's going to follow a binomial distribution. Uh, and with 10 flips of the coin, we can have as many as 10 heads, or maybe as few as zero. But normally the number of heads will be somewhere in between zero and 10, but those are the limits of the situation. And then normally, just like thinking about it intuitively, you're not going to hit those limits very often. You're more often going to get something like some value somewhere in the middle, right? Okay. Never tell me the odds. That's why Han Solo is in the pilot seat. Just like me. All right, so here's an equation for the number of successes, y, we'd expect from flipping an unfair coin, which lands heads up with probability w equals 0.7, 10 times. So I'm following the notation that they use in the paper, or um, Young uses in the paper, um, which is to uh, kind of distinguish between probability and likelihood. So before, we've been using the notation of P for probability. Uh, here we're going to use W just so we can kind of make that distinction. But this is an unfair coin. Um, it's going to land, land heads up with probability W equals 0.7. And we're going to flip it 10 times. And if you don't like to think about a coin uh, which can land heads like 70% of the time, uh, you can think of it more like that uh, Scrabble bag example that we had before, where maybe we had like seven vowels and three consonants in the bag, and we're just picking tiles out. Uh, and every time we get a vowel, we consider it a success of some sort. Um, okay, so here's the equation, which again is just replicated from uh, what's in the paper. Uh, and this is basically telling you how many times you're going to get Y when N equals 10, when you're flipping the coin 10 times and W equals 0.7. So those are the conditions of this sort of conditional probability here. Uh, N equals 10 and W equals 0.7. And like I said, this just follows the binomial distribution. So we've seen this equation before with you know more general uh, variables in it. Um, so uh, this is just the 10 choose Y function here. Uh, and then we have the probability to the Y times of success. And then a failure, it's one minus W or one minus P, it's uh, 0.3 times 10 to the minus y. This will just tell you how often you get a success when you're flipping a coin like this or selecting tiles in a situation like this. We can calculate the same set of probabilities in R. And I'll just crank up my heat a little bit uh, so that I can continue lecturing. Um, I'm just going to copy and paste this whole set here and then kind of walk you through it. <clears throat> so, yeah. I haven't shown you this function before, but this is just creating a probability or a vector of sort of outcomes. Um, and I'm doing this, uh, maybe I'll do it like this, um, running a for loop from 1 to 11 because I couldn't figure out how to get the for loop to just go from 0 to 10, like start at 0. Uh, and so in so doing, I have to create this little variable which subtracts 1 from i. Uh, so this one actually does loop from 0 to 10. Um, yeah. Anyways, uh, this is just that function that's up above, uh, but this is in R command terms rather than nice mathematical terms. The one function we're getting here, which we haven't seen before, is the factorial function. So uh, factorial with 10 in parentheses, just 10 exclamation mark. Uh, 
um, 10 times 9 times 8 times so on and so forth down to 1. Um, and then at the bottom we have this bar plot command which is going to plot what we get out of this function for the varying levels of i. Um, or in fact j. So uh, yeah here's our underlying probability of success and underlying probability of failure. If we actually just not worry about the math and take a look at what the function shows us, um, it looks like this. And this is uh, very similar to what you see in the Myung paper up here um, for, yeah, this first graph here, or actually kind of second one, uh, down on the bottom. This is just how you plot it in R. Uh, so overall, all these bars will end up to one in total, but since the sort of underlying probability is 0.7, we expect to get seven out of 10 successes normally, um, maybe six, maybe eight, with you know decreasing probability like five and nine and as you go over to the tails, um, less and less chance, likelihood of that happening. Okay, so it turns out it can be useful to know the odds in some cases, uh, even if you're not Han Solo. Uh, this is just in case you don't walk through the video or run the R commands yourself. This is what we get out of that function. Uh, we can also take a look at how the distribution changes if we change the underlying probability of success to 0.2. Um, and I kind of have to do this with two different commands here. Sorry about that. But um, all that happens is that the overall distribution shifts way over to the left. And now my expected number of successes or the most likely number of successes, the modal number of successes is two out of 10. Um, and then, you know, fewer successes for one and three, zero and four, so on and so forth. Uh, the Myung paper shows this pretty nicely, um, comparing the two of them right here. Um, and this is also nice, this kind of setup for a different reason, because it kind of helps show you the overlap of um, successes with different probabilities. Uh, so this one has the maximum number of successes at two, this one has the maximum number of successes at seven, but the other outcomes are have some probability in both cases as well, right? Okay, that's kind of where this likelihood analysis comes from. There's what it looks like in R again. So here we go. This is repeating what I just said. The most likely, most likely outcome in both of these cases is what you would expect. So seven successes when W equals 0.7, two successes when W equals 0.2, but you get a range of other likely outcomes in both cases. Um, let's focus on five. So there's a non-zero probability that you would get five successes in both cases. So when W equals 0.7, the probability of five successes is 0.103. And when W equals 0.2, the probability of five successes is 0.026. And we can kind of verify that by going back to the paper or our graphs. So I'm saying this dark bar here is 0.103, just clearing 0.1 here. And then up here for five, it's 0.026. So it's a little bit lower. Um, yeah, what does that mean? Okay, so you can actually work out what this probability will be when uh, W equals all the possible, possible values in between zero and one. And when you do that, you get a function that looks like this. So I think I just mentioned, um, it's when the underlying probability W is 0.7, uh, there's a likelihood of 0.1, I think it was, was it 0.106? Sorry, 0.103. Um, so just over 0.1 here, that uh, you will get five heads in that case, five successes. <clears throat> when the other underlying probability is 0.2, your uh, likelihood of getting five successes is 0.026. So it goes down here. But you get... Um, higher likelihoods in the middle here. So the you most in the most common situation where you'd expect to get five successes is where the underlying probability is 0.5. So what we're calling likelihood now is highest there. And then you know it drifts off on either side. But it what's nice here is we can kind of calculate this in theory. Um, so we get this nice symmetrical distribution on either side. Uh, and it kind of tails off here on the edges for 0.1 and 0.9. Um, yeah, but basically this is saying we could change the probability here on the x-axis. And when we do, that'll change our likelihood of getting five successes. But we can get five successes with a wide variety of different underlying probabilities, basically. Okay, so this is where this subtle distinction comes into play between probability and likelihood. So 
we're dealing not with probability here, which is that underlying probability, but with a likelihood. Okay, so um, basically it's saying that uh, given this probability of you know, certain success in the coin flip, this is the likelihood that you get <clears throat> five successes out of 10 trials or seven successes out of 10 trials. It's looking at it slightly differently. It's flipping it on, on its head. Um, pun intended, of course. So the equation for calculating this likelihood is also a conditional probability that flips our original probability equation on its head. Um, so basically, the likelihood of W given Y equals the expected number of successes given W, uh, or the expected number of Y given W. Um, so to put that another way, before we were expressing, you know, <clears throat> What is the likelihood of, or sorry, if n equals 10 and w equals a certain amount of, or equals a certain probability, um, then what are, was the probability that y equals 7? Um, the likelihood function says, well, what is the likelihood of w being some specific value when n equals 10 and the number of successes is 7? So, the number of successes becomes a condition in the conditional probability of this equation, whereas in this equation, and we're and in this equation, we're trying to figure out what the probability is, the underlying probability. In this equation, uh, one of our underlying conditions is the the probability uh, w, and then we're trying to figure out how many successes we're going to get. Um, this is very subtle. I mean, these are just kind of flipping the equations one way or the other, we're used to kind of thinking in these F terms here, this sort of feed forward way where we know a probability and from that we calculate what the number of successes we get should be. But in reality, our conditions normally look, what we look like what we have over here on the likelihood side of this equation. So we know, like, let's say we flipped a coin 10 times, that's N equals 10, and we got seven heads out of that, Y equals seven those are observable realities. That's data that we can get just from observing what's going on in the world around us. Uh, and on the basis of that, we can try to figure out what is this value of W, right? So, you know, if I hand you a coin, like you would assume maybe that W equals 0.5, but you don't necessarily know, right? Um, so until you try it out, right? So you don't normally have a situation where you have a known probability for some, you know, outcome. Uh, instead, you normally just like run the experiment like you do over here. You get seven successes out of 10 trials. And then from that, you try to figure out what's going on underneath. Um, you know, again, going from phonetics to phonology, if you will. So the following equation will give us the likelihood of success ranging over all possible probabilities given seven observed successes on 10 trials. Uh, and it looks like this. Again, it's going to look a lot like the binomial equation because it basically is. Um, but uh, I'm not going to dwell on it too much. It's in the paper as well because we've seen all this stuff before. Uh, the sort of upshot of this is that um, we can grind out the relevant numbers for this equation in R as well and get that likelihood function as a result. So I'm going to plop these into R, and then this is what our new graph will look like. And again, um, this is just saying, you know, We've run this experiment, we flipped a coin, we got seven heads. What is the underlying probability of getting heads from this coin? And this function says, well, most likely it's 0.7, right? But it could be 0.6 or it could be 0.8. Those are reasonable guesses as well. And then the guesses become less and less reasonable as you kind of fan out to this side. So it's not super reasonable that the underlying probability is 0.2, but you know, you could, that could happen if you run an experiment like this. There's a very small probability you get that result with this underlying probability. Uh, but most likely, the underlying probability is somewhere in this region. And the most, the maximum likelihood is 0.7, right? That's where this function peaks. That's basically what I mean by maximum likelihood estimation. Or I guess what Ronald Fisher meant by it like 100 years ago. Um, so this is that function, again, just in case you don't run the R code yourself. Um, here's a few comments from the Young paper about how this works. So basically, uh, it says, given the observed data and a model of interest, find the one PDF, and what he means by that is not uh, the document type, but the probability density function, which we haven't talked about in a long time, but that's what PDF stands for in stats. 
So given the observed data and a model of interest, find the one PDF among all the probability densities that the model prescribes that is most likely to have produced the data. So again, we're making a guess, we're trying to draw an inference from our data about what's going on behind the scenes, and we're just gonna go with the most likely one. Um, and it's really easy kind of understand this in the coin flipping scenario that, you know, if you get seven out of 10 successes, it's most likely that the underlying probability is 0.7, but it's just good to acknowledge there are other options out there that could produce the same result. The likelihood function is a function of the parameter given a particular set of observed data defined on the parameter scale. Maximum likelihood estimation is a method that seeks the value of the parameter vector that maximizes the likelihood function. These are all just kind of different ways of saying the same thing I've told you a few times already now. Um, but these are good ways of saying it uh, in case the other ones didn't work that well. Uh, the MLE estimates, the maximum likelihood estimation estimates, need not exist nor be unique. Um, that's another kind of useful point um, that you won't necessarily get one right answer out of this. You could get multiple right answers out of this. There's more than one sort of combination of parameters that could lead to the output data that you observe. Um, and that's kind of where this gets hairy and where added computational power really comes in handy. Um, is because uh, once you start dealing with more than one parameter, so like in this graph, we just have one parameter, call it probability, but you could have more than one uh, that you're trying to make a guess about its value from your data, uh, and they can combine in all sorts of different ways that you have to consider. That can be computationally very difficult to work through, um, and that's where modern computing power really makes this easier and is actually the point at which we're gonna stop thinking about the math so much. Uh, but before we do, I'll just remind you, this is what the binomial theorem says. Uh, the likelihood um, equation says the same thing from a different perspective. Uh, as I mentioned here, once you have only, when you have only one parameter, it's easy to calculate explicitly which parameter vector maximizes the likelihood function. As soon as you add in more parameters, though, it gets very complicated and involves some techniques that we, you know, they're kind of easy to think about, but hard to know how to implement, so we're just not gonna talk about them. I'll just say, let R or let the computer do the work and run its magic for you and sort of just benefit from the fact that we live in the 21st century and not the 1920s. Um, yeah, so we're gonna stop there with the math um, and just say the algorithms, you know, some super smart person figured out how to do them and uh, we'll just use them to our benefit. Uh, and then how do we interpret that though? So the basic logic doesn't change we're trying to pin down the parameter values that best predict the data that we've already observed. Okay, so we're going from data to make an inference about what's underlying the data, which is kind of not entirely new based on everything we've been doing already this semester, right? We're always trying to draw that inference. And it's actually not new for anything we do in linguistics. We're just, this in stats, we have sort of a more formal or quantifiable way of doing it, right? Uh, so we're trying to draw inference from the data that we can observe about parameters or principles that are going on behind the scenes. Um, okay, so after that kind of long digression, this is how you get a likelihood score when you have a model which has, has one or more parameters in it. Uh, and that likelihood score just fits into that big L slot in the equation for AIC that I mentioned several slides ago. Okay, so that's kind of how we're building model, um, building up models for explaining data in a multiple regression scenario. Uh, but remember, we're counterbalancing that with like the number of parameters we have or that we're trying to figure out um, as part of our model. So uh, let's run, run through a few examples using R code to see how this works in practice. And what's kind of fun about this, um, what uh, you pick up, if hopefully you read the chapter on this or the reading part of it in the QML textbook, um, is that you can get R to add in factors iteratively, iteratively in a stepwise process to determine which factors actually improve the model significantly and which factors don't really help all that much. Um, that's gonna be easier for me to explain when I kind of show you the output of this command. Um, but part of why it happens that way is because uh, the model building is kind of conditional. Um, so if you do read this, part of the textbook, which I signed as the reading, uh, you'll find that, uh, or learn that one of the issues with using multiple independent factors to explain a dependent variable is that the independent factors themselves can be correlated with one another. So uh, they kind of don't 
necessarily have entirely independent contributions to make to uh, the explanation. And for that reason, um, the amount that you can get out of, uh, the amount of explanation you can get out of adding a new factor can depend on what's already in the model. Uh, and again, it'll be easier for me to explain how that works if I show you an example. I'm gonna show you the first example, which is from baseball. So if you hate baseball, don't understand it, don't care, you can skip the next couple minutes of this video uh, and we'll get to a language example after it. I just think this is a nice example again uh, of an interesting um, issue in baseball, which if you are a fan, you might hopefully get something out of. Um, so I'm gonna give you a new baseball data set, or at least I'm gonna give it to myself by plopping it into R here. Uh, and then, show you that the data includes these variables. Um, so one thing that people do in the baseball statistics world is they try to come up with the best predictors for how many runs a team will score per game. So uh, if you remember, the basic way to win a game is to score more runs than your opponent. A run is where you get all the way around the diamond back to home. Uh, and so that's our dependent measure, and we're trying to figure out what contributes most to that. And then, you know, usually the strategy is, well, whatever contributes most to that, you know, you want to do the most of, um, right, to win the game. So uh, there's base hits per plate appearance. That's where you hit the ball in fair territory, and you can run to as many bases as you can reach. Um, those are good for the offense. There's also what I'm calling unintentional walks per plate appearance. That's when... Um, the pitcher throws you four unhittable and unhittable balls before throwing you three hittable balls. There's also intentional walks, which is uh, in the strategy part of this. Let me get to the fifth um, factor first. But uh, the fifth factor is times hit by pitch. So if you are hit by a pitch from the pitcher, you get to go to first base for free. If you um, get what's called a walk, where you get four unhittable pitches before three hittable pitches, then you also get to go to first base, but no further. Uh, so in this second one, um, this base hits factor, you can get to as many bases as you can reach. For these next three, you only get one. Um, so that's where the fourth factor comes in. Sometimes a team will look at a batter and say, that guy's so good, we don't want to give him a chance to get a base hit. So we will intentionally walk him. Um, and in the old days, they would throw four balls that were so far out of his reach that it wasn't even close. There's no chance he'd get to hit it. Now they just say, okay, just put the guy on first base because we don't want to have to deal with him. Uh, so the question uh, that this model can help answer, which is interesting, is whether this strategy works um, and do intentional walks sort of um, not harm the defense in the same way that the unintentional walks do. Because uh, in both cases, the guy gets to first base, but no further. Um, so I'm going to show you how this works with this summary command. So this is pretty elaborate. Here's our data um, and actually show it to you. And I don't want to dwell on baseball too much, but I guess I might as well load it up here and just say, here it is. So this is for 30 teams. I think this is also from the 2010 um, season, just how many runs they score per game and then how often do these other events happen. Um, okay. so. We'll run this multiple regression model. And this is the stepwise version of the model. So that's why it has this syntax in here about y dot step and then step, all this stuff. Um, this bit here probably looks fairly familiar. This is saying we're going to generate a linear model. Uh, and then our dependent measure is runs per game, like how often do teams or how many runs does team score per game. This is the sort of... Um, this is our dependent measure, and then we're saying as this depends on. And then for where we normally have an independent variable, it just has number one, um, which this is the way the model starts out. And it basically says uh, that's the null hypothesis, that none of these variables we're going to consider actually make a contribution to this at all. So we'll start out with a null model where everything's just random chance, basically. Uh, and then it specifies this is the data. <clears throat> and then over here, it specifies, well, maybe um, look at these factors and how they might contribute to this dependent measure. Uh, and it's because it's the stepwise function, it's going to add these in step by step. And that won't make sense until I hit return here. But I'm going to do that, and it's going to go by in a flash, and I'll walk you through what happened, which is kind of fun. So um, these numbers, 
should hopefully make some sense here. We got degrees of freedom, sum of squares, residual sum of squares, then also AIC. So this is the Akaike information criterion value. At the start, it's negative 37.39. This is for our null model, where just like it's all random variance um, for runs per game and nothing explains it. Uh, so it starts out at that negative 37 level. And then what this function does is that it independently adds all of these four factors that we're considering here and asks, well, does it do better than none? And it turns out that two of them do do better than none. So what this notation means is that the plus symbol says, um, I'm going to add base hit percentage. And then if I do that, I'll calculate what my AIC is as a result of that using that sort of model. And if it's more negative than the null model, then I will add in that factor. However, it also kind of weighs that against adding in other factors. So it turns out um, these unintentional walks also improve the predictability of runs per game because the AIC goes down. So we've got two factors here that if we add them, do better than nothing, which is nice. Then these other two factors, the intentional walks and the hits getting hit by pitches factor, um, they don't do better than the null model. So we're not going to consider adding them. For these other two, what we wind up doing is we take the one that um, sort of improves the model the most, which is the base hits factor. So we'll start out with that. So the next time we go through the cycle, well, this is our null model. It's runs per game, and that depends on base hit percentage. Do we need to add anything else to the model? Um, and so what it does is it, interestingly enough, considers four other options. So here's where we're starting now. We're no longer at negative 37. We're at negative 58. Um, so we can consider adding the unintentional walk percentage, and that improves the model by a lot. It takes it down to negative 98. Uh, now the hits hit by pitches percentage, however you say that, uh, does improve the model a little bit. It wasn't doing that before, but remember, like I said, this stuff is conditional. It depends on how you add these things and in the order in which you add them. Um, the intentional walk is still not helping. And then it also interestingly like considers, what if I take this um, factor away? Maybe that would improve it, but it doesn't. Um, so we take the one that helps the most, unintentional walks. Now we're way down to negative 98. We we'll keep repeating this process uh, one more time. It decides that adding the HBP percentage does improve it a little bit to negative 100. Um, and that's one of those where you kind of have to weigh it against just adding a third parameter to the model. That one's probably pretty close, but it's good enough that it does better than nothing. Um, so we have those all three of those factors into our latest model. Then we compare what would happen, what that model would do in comparison to changing all those factors, including getting rid of each one of the ones that's in the model, and then also still adding this intentional walks percentage. But nothing does better than negative 100. Nothing does better than what we've got here. So we'll just keep it. That's how we built that model, which is kind of fun. Um, so at the end of the day, we say runs per game depends on if the batter gets base hit, if the batter gets an unintentional walk, if the batter gets hit by a pitch. Um, what doesn't help the team score runs per game, though, is the intentional walks. So it looks like that strategy works. You can intentionally walk a guy, give him first base, without suffering a penalty in terms of how many runs they're going to score. Okay, if you're interested in baseball, now you know. <laughs> if you don't care, uh, this is just how you build a model like this, a multiple regression model. Uh, and then after that, this process um, runs a regular regression analysis sort of in the way that we're used to. Like, what is the average run score per game? If you have none of these factors, it's this meaningless negative 7.6 number. Uh, and then it kind of runs this analysis, like, is this significant in the model? And yes, it is. Is this significant? Yes, it is. Uh, weirdly, the HBP percentage turns out not to be significant, according to P. If the alpha is 0.05, the P is bigger than that. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on that too much, but this one was kind of borderline anyways. That's all I'm going to say about it. Um, but basically, this is what you get at the end of sort of creating this model, is this additional multiple regression analysis. Um, this is also kind of nice here. It, sh it says that uh, R squared is about 0.89, so we're able to explain most of the sort of variance in the data with this sort of model, uh, which is cool too. Okay, apologies for that. We're back to linguistics. Let's be honest, you got sick of baseball a long time ago. I haven't, but oh well. Um, one thing you're not uh, sick of is 
linguistics, and hopefully you're not uh, sick of this monomorphemic, monosyllabic words database because we're going to play around with it again. Uh, but let's load that one in. Um, and it'll take a little bit, but we'll run the same sort of analysis with this. And what I want to analyze is the response time in a lexical decision task. So here's our dependent measure. Um, again, you just see a string of words and you have to say, is that a word or not? Um, yes or no. <clears throat> we'll start off with the null model, which says that nothing explains that uh, variation in that response time, but we will consider four different factors. Maybe familiarity with the word or the possible word or the frequency of the word, how many letters it has, and then how many neighbors it has, how many phonological neighbors. Maybe these things could affect the response time in this task. Okay, let's run it and see what it tells us. Again, it goes by quick, but we can walk through it step by step, right? So we start off with our null model. And this says, well, the thing that uh, all these do better than nothing, because here's where we start off with an EIC of negative 16,919. The best factor, the factor that explains the most of the variance is the familiar familiarity. <clears throat> so yeah, if you're familiar with a word, you can re uh, recognize it um, more quickly. Uh, so we'll use that as our next step model with that one factor in it. And we compare that to sort of changing all the other factors here. We find that adding in frequency as an explanatory factor also improves the model. So we'll add that on top of familiarity. And now we have a model that looks like this, familiarity pl plus frequency. Um, the last step considers either adding letters or phonological neighbors or potentially getting rid of frequency or familiarity. None of those does better than the model we have in place. So we'll just leave it at that. And again, it runs this multiple regression analysis that looks like this, telling us the intercept uh, and then familiarity and frequency. Um, and it tests those and says, well, these are significant factors. They do explain um, a meaningful part of the variance. Our overall R squared here is pretty low. It's not as easy to make sense of what people do in experiments as it is to make sense of baseball, which is kind of, I guess, why I draw on those examples, I guess. But I, I apologize. I won't talk about it again. Um, what I want to talk about, though, is what these output parameters mean. So this is our intercept, 6.78. And I think that was a log adjusted measure of the overall response time. But basically, if this is bigger, it means longer response time. So what does that mean for these estimates of the slopes of these two different factors? So we have familiarity and we have frequency. This one is negative 0.0366 something. And this is negative 0.01. What does that mean that they're negative? <clears throat> it means that the more familiar you are with a word, the higher that measure gets, the shorter your response time will be in this sort of task, right? So bigger familiarity, response time goes down. That's why it's negative. It's a negative correlation there, right? And that's a bigger effect here for familiarity than it is for frequency, which is about half that in size. Uh, and this is a small number, but it's in the direction where you kind of expect. The more familiar you are with something, the easier for it is for you to recognize it, right? Okay, um, got just one other example here. I also want to try it with the RT naming measure as our dependent variable. So this is where you see a word and, or a string of letters and you have to say it out loud uh, what that word is or what that string of letters is. So it's just uh, measuring the amount of time it takes you to do that. Um, and then we'll look at our same four factors again in this stepwise model building process. And what do we get? Turns out we get everything, uh, which is kind of interesting, right? So uh, in this case, our first factor, when we start out with the null model, um, it turns out that adding frequency improves it more than all the others. Uh, but familiarity and letters also help out as well, so we'll keep them in mind. Um, so first factor we add is frequency. The second one turns out to be letters, which is interesting. Um, so, but that you can kind of think of when you see you know, a word that has more letters in it, it might take you longer to say that out loud or to prepare to say that out loud, I guess. You just have more planning you have to do. Thirdly, we get phonological neighbors. Um, so we add that factor in as well, like how many 
other words are there in the language that are similar to the word that we're trying to say, so on and so forth. And we just keep getting better and better. Every single factor does better than the models we have in place, but at the end we add familiarity as well. We're just doing this in a different order, in particular that order of four factors. Uh, and then once we get them all in there, uh, it doesn't make sense to take any of them out. So we just leave it at that. Uh, but we can go back here to the results of our multiple regression model. Again, unfortunately, we're explaining a very small amount of the variance. So even though these wind up being significant, or at least some of them are, um, it's not a huge effect size because uh, I guess there's a lot that feeds into like how long it takes you to say a word. But when we look at these parameters, again, they're kind of working in the directions that we expect, right? So with frequency, the more frequent a word is, the easier it is for you to say it, or you can say it more quickly. Same thing for familiarity. But for letters, right, the longer, the more letters a word has in it, the longer it will take you to say it. And in fact, the more neighbors a word has, the longer it will take you to say it too, um, which is kind of interesting. So there, in this particular case, there, there's apparently competition from those other neighbors. They want you to say them as well. And you kind of have to work to kind of tamp them down so you can get out the word that you have to say. Uh, that's what those positive numbers mean there is basically the bigger that factor is, the longer the naming time becomes. Okay, uh, I have talked a lot um, today, uh, so I'm just going to try to wrap it up with this last slide. The truth is never simple. So um, remember in this database, the f frequency and familiarity measures are not entirely independent of one another, and that's kind of the moral of uh, the reading here. Um, and I decided it's not worth it to talk about the math, uh, but you can look it up in the textbook if you want. Just remember that when you have measures like familiarity and frequency, they will be connected or correlated with one another. So just um, by adding one, you kind of get some of the other as well. The R value between them is uh, 0.79, so that's a pretty healthy correlation. So uh, we can kind of compare this. Uh, for our RT lexical decision model, we just had these two factors, right? Um, those were the only ones we decided were worth adding to it. Um, so we can look at this, and these are um, <clears throat> our slope factors. Remember, they're negative, and familiarity was about twice as big as frequency. Uh, but that's what we get when we add both in there. If we add just one in there, like familiarity, um, it turns out that slope becomes bigger, right? It's negative 0.06 rather than negative 0.036. Uh, so it's kind of like the model, when we just only consider familiarity, is kind of taking into consideration some of that other variance that we had um, that could be due to frequency, but is correlated with familiarity, right? We get a clearer picture of those contributions when we split them up and we add two models or two factors to the model. Uh, but when we add just one, we're still gonna try to explain as much as we can with that factor. And it turns out you can kind of explain some of the frequency contribution to it just from familiarity numbers alone. And we can also compare that to um, just a model with only frequency. And here we get a negative 0.037. So again, that's bigger than what we'd see for frequency in the two factor model here. Um, so yeah, that's part of what you have to consider in developing a multiple regression model. Uh, like I said, the textbook walks you through the math. Um, for our purposes at this point in the semester, we can just trust that R is doing the math correctly, uh, but it will help to kind of learn how to interpret what these um, parameters of the model are telling us and how that model gets built in the first place. But for now, um, that's all we need to know about multiple regression. We're going to do more model building in the next two lectures on logistic regression and the linear mixed effects models at the tail end. So uh, I'll call it a day for now. And what do you know? The snow is starting to come down. So I'll leave you with this little Christmassy scene uh, of gentle snowflakes and say, I'll see you next time.